crystals. She should have a watch on. I guess it's time. She got it with her watch. <clears throat> hmm. That's interesting. Let's see something here. All right. Good evening, everybody. Lydia, you want to come up here? We got a seat saved for you. It's up my granddaughter. She's, uh, she's taking geology at, um, at Utah Tech, and she wanted to come and, and see this talk today. So thank you for coming. Uh, I was supposed to give this um, presentation uh, two years ago, but uh, COVID prevented me from doing it. So <clears throat> I've had a lot more time to think about it and um, add a lot more jokes uh, into the presentation. Uh, very little content was added, but uh, no, actually, I did get a chance to synthesize a lot of my thoughts, so it should be even better post-COVID. So this is what we're going to cover this evening. Who's uh, familiar with plate tectonics? Yeah. If you're not, you will be. Um, I'm going to go over the history of it and the development of the idea and how it evolved uh, with the scientific method. Just to kind of give you an idea of how uh, scientific theories and concepts evolve over time and how long it takes. We'll talk about the t uh, tectonic history of our area, the southwest U.S. And then I'll, I'll discuss how the Pine Valley Mountains uh, came to be. The type of structure that they are, the timing and the composition, and also uh, a new idea that I'll introduce this evening. Um, for the second time, because I have presented it before. And then I'll discuss how the Pine Valley Mountains uh, impacted our local geology. Okay. Okay. This is what, what we will not discuss. Uh, religion, <laughs> politics, global climate change, fracking, <laughs> nutrition, personal finance, and parenting methods. <laughs> this is the pre-COVID list. Um, there are a couple more items that you could put on there, I'm sure, but uh, we'll leave those out tonight. Okay, this is the uh, price of oil uh, versus time out to about, little, uh, about 2015. I was hired on by Shell in the uh, late 70s, and um, during that, my tenure, these, all of these arrows were uh, significant layoffs uh, that corresponded to dips in the oil price. It was about a layoff every two and, a, two and three quarter years. That's what we endured. And after almost 30 years, I kind of referred to Popeye, and I said, that's all I can stand, I can't stand no more, and we left. We left Houston and moved out here. So after that, I spent some time teaching, but that didn't, that didn't go too well. Um, why science teachers aren't asked to uh, monitor recess. <clears throat> and then we worked off and on for Rhodes Scholar for coming up on 15 years now. So we've been, uh, we've been um, active in the community and active uh, with the university, um, taking people out on tours um, to all the national parks. All right. So by a show of hands, how many of you here have been through intense psychotherapy? Okay, I, I, okay, okay. I heard, I heard uh, from a friend that uh, therapists gather observations about our past um, in order to understand why we are the way that we are. It helps them understand why we behave the way we behave. Now, geologists do that as well. Uh, they gather observations about the Earth's past in order to understand the evolution of present day settings, only our office is a little bit different. Um, we like to go out in the field and gather observations and, uh, and ponder what happened um, in every place that we visit. So being an observational science, we gather observations and we utilize geology, biology, physics, chemistry, and as little math as possible, <clears throat> and we come up with interpretations. And most of our time is spent um, gathering observations. And it's usually pretty simple, usually. 
Here, for example, are two young geologists out in the field, and they see a rather large mouse and a rather large litter box. It says, judging by these, I'd say there are big cats in the area. So <laughs> observation and interpretation. <laughs> observation and interpretation. Sometimes it's not so simple. <clears throat> Here's a Colgate uh, dental floss ad. You can see the material in his teeth, and you get a floss ad. And well, at first glance, you look at it, you know, okay, I understand that. Here's another one. Uh, you can see another. You can see the teeth, and you see the dental floss kind of drawing your eye over the, in that direction. And here's another one. Here again, you can see his teeth and the floss and the big red arrow pointing in, in, uh, in that direction. So a lot of times when you go out in the field, you're drawn to certain things, and you don't see everything the first time you go out. So a lot of times it takes multiple visits to the field. So here again, take a look at this close up. And how many of you noticed that he's missing an ear? <laughs> no? This can't possibly be her hand, right? <laughs> and this young lady has six fingers, two of them, <laughs> two index fingers it looks like. So we don't always see things first time we, we, we uh, go out in the field. So they usually aren't as they first appear, and we need to take the time and be patient and carefully assimilate all of the observations, and gradually the picture becomes clear. And it's usually not what you think it is. So let's talk about uh, plate tectonics and start making some observations. This is a very uh, primitive look at the interior of the Earth. Uh, it really doesn't look like this. Um, modern day uh, geophysics has shown us that all of these layers speak to one another. They communicate with one another. Hawaii is a hot spot, for instance, that emanates from the core. So is Yellowstone. But for the purposes of our discussion, this is fine because I'm really going to focus on this part of it right here. We live on continental crust. That makes up the continents. The oceans are made up of what we call oceanic crust, very different compositions, okay? One is, who's been out in Snow Canyon? The black material, all that basalt, that's oceanic crust that has come up to the surface, okay? And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. Hey, Bob. So all of the brown areas are continental crust, and all the blue areas are areas of oceanic crust, continental, oceanic. And back in 1912, Alfred Wegener, who was a meteorologist, proposed the theory of continental drift. He noticed that when you look at South America and Africa, if you put those two continents together, it'd be quite a nice fit. That wasn't the only observation he made. He actually went in the field and looked at the rocks and the fossils across uh, not only India and Africa, but South America, Antarctic, and Australia. And he noticed that there was a connection there. So he proposed that theory, but what do you think uh, happened when he presented it? He got at the stake. Yeah, just about. He got burned at the stake. Yeah, and the reason, the reason being is he didn't have a really good understanding of what the mechanism was that drove the continents apart. Okay. Not enough observations were made for him to come to that conclusion and for the theory to stick. But he contended that 200 million years ago, there was a supercontinent called Pangaea that began to split apart then. So in the scientific method, you know, we, we ask a question, we do some background research, construct a hypothesis, test it by doing an experiment, analyze the data, and then report your results. And at the time that Wegener did this, he was probably somewhere in here when he presented this idea. Uh, the, his conclusions. He really didn't have enough information to bring it all the way to completion. Now, during World War II, there was a gentleman by the name of Harold Hess. He was a PhD geologist at Princeton. He, um, he actually uh, worked in the Navy during World War II looking for places for German U-boats to hide, where they might be hiding. He used uh, side-scan sonar, some primitive echo techniques, and magnetometers. So he, he agreed uh, with many of Wegener's observations, 
But he had very different views on large-scale continental uh, movements. So he studied the ocean basins using echo soundings, magnetometers, and side scan sonar. He presented his ideas um, in 1959. He noticed that the ocean floors had very large mountain chains uh, running down the center of the ocean basins, especially in the Atlantic. He called it the Mid-Ocean Ridge. Um, but he, he thought there was higher heat flow there, but he really didn't have the theory in hand uh, at that time. That was in 1959. Three years later, he presented a paper and published it called The History of the Ocean Basins, and he came up with the term seafloor spreading. He said that there was higher heat flow along these mountain ridges and that crust was being created along those ridges. But he really didn't have any age information to make that claim. Okay? So, and he also said that there may be some kind of convective flow in the mantle that would cause the, the crust to be created at that central ridge. So when you look at where he was um, at that time, so we're talking about 50 years later, the, the theory advanced uh, significantly, but still we needed more data. Now during that time, they were running magnetometers across, across the Atlantic try, looking for U-boats, for looking for um, good places to uh, to put transcon transcontinental, transocean uh, cables uh, for communications. And this map was made, uh, it's a modern map, but it's, a, it's, it's basically a, what's called a magnetic stripe map. And the mid-ocean ridge runs right down this white line. And what you see on either side of that ocean ridge are these symmetrical bands that are reversals in the magnetic pole. Okay, so as that magma cooled, the, the, the north, north axis of the pole had actually started to shift. So as it, as it congealed, it's, it froze in what, where my magnetic north was. So it kind of looked like, if you look at a cross section across here, it would look like this. Here's the central ridge, and then there's a symmetrical display of anomalies on either side. They weren't quite sure what they meant at that time, so um, it was a great observation. It built on, on Wegener and on Hess's ideas, but we still weren't there yet. But then came along the DSDP, the Deep Sea Drilling Project, the Ocean Drilling Project, and the International Drilling po Project. And they drilled thousands of core holes in the ocean basins and age dated the material. And this is what they came up with, a map. So what they did was they, they age dated these stripes. And what they found was the youngest crust was being created along this band, this mid-ocean ridge. The oldest crust was away from the ridge, so we're spanning from recent all the way out to um, 130, in some cases, older, million years, all the way out into the Jurassic. So now they took those magnetic stripes and they age dated them, and all of a sudden Harry Hess's idea of seafloor spreading came into focus, that he was right. Seafloor was being created at the mid-ocean ridges, and it was pushing the continents apart um, uh, perpendicular to that ridge. So it took a total of you know, 70 years for that theory to come to fruition. It just didn't happen with an idea. It sparked, uh, sparked some controversy. Okay. So if you look at all, the, all these observations of earthquakes and volcanoes um, and mid-ocean ridges where crust is being created, Right here, all these divergent boundaries, when you see the arrows going up, that's where crust is being created along these mountain chains, here and here. This is a convergent belt. That's where plates come together, and one dives down below the other. Um, those are massive earthquake zones. So this right here, this area right in here is the ring of fire, where you have um, convergent plate boundaries. So is this, would you say this is a good place to have a uh, nuclear power plant? <laughs> like Fukushima. That's what it's located along, a convergent plate boundary, one of the most seismically active zones. And as we saw, that was a, a huge mistake. In fact, if you look at the geotechnical report for Fukushima, the plant was built on ancient tsunami deposits. Pretty sad that we didn't... Uh, that they didn't heed the warning. Okay, so crust is being created along this mid-ocean ridge. 
like this right here, divergence and crusts being destroyed along this ridge right here, this uh, position right here, where one plate is going down below the other, achieving a significant depth so that it melts and it comes up as volcanic activity at the surface. Okay, it's kind of just a little animation to kind of show you what we think is going on with these large convective cells that Hess theorized we can see these um, with some more, more, more modern uh, geophysical data. So we have spreading, crust creation, and crust destruction going on. Okay. So Wegener was right. The continents were together. He just didn't have enough information, enough data to actually say definitively um, that they were. But now we know what the mechanism is to push the continents apart. And we have convergent boundaries, we have divergent boundaries, and this is a transform boundary. Anybody know what fault that is? San Andreas, San Andreas correct. Okay. So plate tectonics is um, it's kind of like, if you look at the Earth, it's kind of like an egg where you have a yolk, a white, and a shell. Only the shell is broken up into a bunch of little, little plates, okay, that move around with respect to one another. And if we understand the movement of these plates, we can explain earthquakes, volcanism, mountain building, and subsidence. So that's what plate tectonics, the theory or the concept, is all about, the movement of plates driven by a nuclear engine at the core. Okay, so that's the background of plate tectonics. I hope that kind of clarifies everything and levels uh, the knowledge field on how the theory was developed. It took a long time for it to develop, to develop into what we know today. So let's look at the southwest U.S. and look at the tectonic history here. So we had an early compression period um, between 80 and 35 million years ago, give or take 5 to 10 million years on either side, uh, mostly on the older side, where one plate was diving down below the other, the Farallon plate, and it buckled the crust out in front of it, creating folds, okay, ridges and valleys, anticlines and synclines. Sometimes if you go to the Valley of Fire, you'll see this, some nice thrust faults. If you go out to the west here into the Matakwa area, you see really nice thrust faults due to compression that occurred during this time period. And then we had later extension. As the Farallon plate pulled away, it actually extended the crust and it communicated uh, these, these faults that developed like in the basin and range. It came down into these magma chambers and allowed a lot of that material to come up to the surface. This one in particular is one that we're going to focus on today. So here's a little, it's going to be a little animation of what ex exactly happened. It's going to start at about 40, 38 million years ago. So during that compressive time, this is a mountain chain. This is a spreading center, uh, divergent plate boundary. Here's the edge of the continent. This Farallon plate is diving down below the continent, North American continent. And what you'll see is that right down on here, this mountain range is going to bump into the North American continent, and it's going to stall the, the uh, actual spreading. And we'll see how it goes from there. I'll play this a couple of times just to kind of show you. This demonstrates the tectonic history of our area. Compression, look how skinny Nevada is. <laughs> and then at about 22 million years ago or so, 25 to 22, it starts to reverse and extend the North American continent. Look at Nevada, the basin and range develops. The Colorado Pl Pl Plateau gets uplifted, and the San Andreas Fault system starts to uh, develop as well. So here again, compression. Diving down, and now it reverses, pulling away and pulling the continent with it, extending it to the northwest, and creating the San Andreas Fault system. Okay. Yes, ma'am. What caused that change? Ah, yeah. Well, it was differential spreading. Plus, you had a, you had a continent, right, with a, with a mountain chain uh, butting up against it. it. It couldn't go any further. So we think that it stalled there, and it just started to have differential spreading and moving it to the northwest. That's the, our best guess at this time. Let's look at some visible, good question, visible evidence of great forces at work. So for compression, we have folds, we have uplift, and we have faulting. So let's look, take a look at folds, because that's the most important one that we're going to look at. 
So in an ideal world with a homogeneous medium, we can fold something. And those folds are very symmetrical. They call them isoclinal. But in our case, they aren't. They're asymmetric. All of these folds that you see here, the Kaibab uplift, Circle Cliffs uplift, anybody been out here to see the San Rafael swell? As you're traveling north going up um, toward um, Highway 70, what do you see on the left-hand side of the road as you're going by the San Rafael swell? You see the beds almost standing on end because that fold is asymmetric. The eastern side of it is standing almost vertically. So it's an asymmetric fold where one, one side is, is uh, dipping shallower than the east side. And that's because the compression was from the west. So if someone's pushing me on this side, I'm going to lean to the other side, right? All of these folds are asymmetric because of the direction of compression. We have one right here. Has anybody uh, driven through an anticline on the way to Zion National Park? Who's been to Zion National Park? You've driven through the anticline. <laughs> this is the Virgin Anticline. And I'll show you a picture of it. Okay. So here's here's St. George, Santa Clara flows. You know, we're sitting right up in right up in there. Oh, that's my home. We're right over here. Our home. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so this feature right here is the Virgin Anticline. Everybody see that? That is actually a fold in the upper part of the Earth's crust. If you look at it from this vantage point, this is what it looks like going down the road. Uh, Purgatory's over here, right? So this is the, the west limb and this is the east limb. And it is an asymmetric fold uh, leaning toward the east because compression was from the west. Okay. Does that make sense, pretty much? This really doesn't. <laughs> I can't, I really can't figure this guy out. I can't figure out how he got in or how he got out, but I've probably shown this how many times, honey? About 50, so I still can't figure it out. But anyway, um, not a fun thing. I wonder if we could dim the lights. Sarah! She's listening in the other room. Maybe she can dim the lights. Okay. Let's look at some visible evidence of extensional forces in here. So extension in our area expresses itself as faults, joints, and volcanism. In Nevada, this could mean something else. So, so let's look at faults. <laughs> so this is a normal fault. When you start to extend the crust, which is a brittle medium, um, you develop a zone of weakness. Could we dim the lights a little, if we could? And one, one side of the fault goes down with respect to the other, okay? And we have a hanging wall and a foot wall, okay? If we rotate that block diagram, rotate. <laughs> Sometimes you'll see waterfalls, and a lot of times waterfalls or steps that you see, large steps, vertical steps, are due to faulting. Okay, this is a, um, a map. This is Leverkin right in here. Anybody know what's right here? This is Highway 9. You take a sharp right turn. Maverick. Yeah. Maverick, right? <laughs> Rest stop before you start uh, hitting the road further up. And as you come up this road, I think Lydia was you were baptized right there, I think. Um, you come up this road, you kind of climb up this hill right here, right? That, that's the Hurricane Fault. That's the trace of the Hurricane Fault. That fault's got five to 7,000 feet of offset on it right there. So as you're coming around this corner, you're actually coming up onto the Colorado Plateau. That's the western edge of the Colorado Plateau. That's pretty cool. Just turn the lights off. Yeah, turn them off. Okay, let me ask. Um, if we turn the lights off, do you promise to stay awake? No. Okay. Okay, sure. Give it a try. There we go. Is that better? That's good. Okay, so what we're looking at is one side going down with respect to the other, and that would be the, the hurricane fault. Up, up thrown block, Colorado Plateau, down thrown block, the hurricane Graben. Okay, we'll talk more about that in a minute. About joints, joints are merely cracks in the rock that haven't moved. If, I, if my hand is, uh, represents, if my, the space between my fingers represents um, joints or cracks, if they move, they automatically get reclassified as a fault. Most joints are, are really faults. They have some movement on them, but 
We call them joints. Uh, they're everywhere around here due to extension. Um, so you take a solid block of sandstone, pull it apart, and you start to get these, these joints that eventually become great hiking areas called slot canyons. Here's Bluff Street right here. This is 600 West. And you can see an aerial shot uh, just due to extension, all these, these um, joints that occurred due to extension. Okay, now we're starting to get into the meat of the, of the talk. How the Pine Valley Mountains came to be. And for that, we're going to have to talk about volcanism. Okay. So remember, we had um, subduction. We had one plate going down below the other, right here, right along this, this boundary. And we parked a bunch of magma right here, right, right below our, our feet, uh, right in our area. So with extension, these faults, these extensional faults, tapped into those magma chambers down below. And some of that material made it to the surface. Not a whole lot, maybe 10, 20 percent of the magma chamber made it to the surface and congealed. So our area, where we are uh, in St. George, kind of looks like this with some large magma chambers that some of them are still, still liquid. Um, and we have features that come up along fractures that form radial dikes, some volcanoes, some, um, some cinder cones, volcanoes, mix, lava flows. So we see a lot of this and sedimentary rocks that are intruded by this magmatic material. Occasionally, one of these features comes up and it's kind of like a volcano wannabe. It never made it to the surface. And that's called a lacolith. And that was first used by Gilbert to describe a feature, um, the Henry Mountains, um, which is, again is another lacolith. There are many lacoliths in, in Utah, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. So this is how a lacolith forms. We have a bunch of sedimentary layers, and then we have extension, and we allow some of that material to come up. It taps into that magma chamber, and it comes up, but it doesn't quite make it to the surface. And it hits this, this zone of weakness. Now, for the last 15 years, I've been showing this slide, and I've always I've always cringed whenever I show this because I did not understand what this zone of weakness could be. You know, and I always said, please don't ask me. No, but you could ask me tonight in a little while. I think I have an explanation. <laughs> we'll see. Um, and this occurs several kilometers below the surface. And it, it, through several uh, episodes of injection, it bows up the surface, okay, and then it cools and becomes a rock that's called a monzonite, which I'll show you in a little while. So this is about, above the, about 500 to 600 feet of cover sits on top of the lacolith, and we think that it was pretty rapid, between 100 and 2,500 years um, that it took to place that lacolith material um, into the sedimentary column. So what happens after that, it gets exposed to the elements. It's fractured, right, from the uplift. It starts to break up at the top, and it gets eroded. And what we're left with at the surface is that monzonite, that igneous rock that, that cooled beneath the surface. And that's what the Pine Valley Mountains are, with the highest peak of 10365 at Signal Peak. And we think that it's one of the largest known lacoliths on Earth. And we're very lucky here because it forms a rain shadow, so it affects our climate as well. All those fronts that come in from the north, all that, that, that warm and cool air rises over that 10,000 foot peak, and the air contracts and it can't hold the precipitation, so all the air that comes over the mountain is pretty dry. So it actually forms the northern edge of the Mojave Desert in our area because it's rain shadowing effects. Okay. So here's a map of uh, the iron axis. Okay, this goes from here to Cedar City. And the Pine Valleys sit right here. Anybody notice anything weird about the Pine Valleys? Look at this. Does it look like this? Almost you could lay a ruler on that. The northern boundary is kind of, kind of uh, delineated. What, what, do you, what do you think that could be? I think it might be a fault or a fracture or something. Could be. I don't know. Uh, I noticed it uh, a couple of years back. I'm not sure exactly what it is. But so what we're looking at 
is material that was from ocean, ocean, um, cr oceanic crust that subducted below the North American continent. And then when we had extension, we communicated that material to the surface through fractures and faults as the crust extended between 20 and 25 million years ago, say. So if you look at the ages of these, the pine valleys are between 20 and 20 and a half, their age dates, but some of them get up to 20 uh, to 25, 22 to 25 million years old. There are other lacoliths in Utah. We've all heard of these, right? The Henrys, the Abajos, the LaSalles, and Navajo Mountain. The Henrys, the Abajo, and the LaSalles range anywhere from 22 to 28 or so million years, 29. So they're falling in the range of when that extension started to occur. Navajo, not so sure about that. The, there's not a whole lot of uh, information in the literature that I could find. 20 to 30 million, is, uh, but it's not confirmed. So all of these, these um, mountain ranges, these lacoliths in Utah, are related to extension. And they all have ore deposits associated with them, with the exception of Navajo Mountain which I think is a, interesting as well. Okay, so I brought with me a very, very sophisticated earth model to show you, demonstrate to you what extension, how extension works. I'm gonna need two very nimble volunteers from the audience that can help me do this. Anybody, any volunteers? Lydia, you wanna do it? Lee, you wanna do it, Lee? Okay. Nothing like family. <laughs> well, maybe not. Okay, could you just hold that up right where my hand is? Yeah. And Lydia, could you hold it up here? Okay. So this is, just imagine that this is the, the Earth's crust. And what we're going to do is we're going to start to extend it. Okay, so when we extend it, what we do with the surface is we create this steer step on a large scale. You can actually see this in Snow Canyon um, on a smaller scale, uh, with one side kind of doing this and the other side doing, doing this, creating the sag that you see um, in Snow Canyon. That's why the canyon's there. Um, imagine taffy. If you pull taffy, you create a sag, right? Well, this is a brittle medium, so when you pull it apart, it, it breaks out into chunks, little fault blocks. So what happens along this, um, along this, this terrain is that rivers are captured, along these, like the Santa Clara River is captured along the Gunlock Fault. The uh, Perea River is captured along, anybody know which fault? The Ponzagon Fault, I thought I'd get you. <laughs> the Severe River is captured along the Severe Fault. These are all extensional faults, so all the rivers and canyons are usually located along faults like this. What else can happen? What else can these faults tap into? Magma chambers? Yeah. So if we're lucky, we might see some mag magmatic activity come up along one of these faults as well. So, yeah. Thank you. Awesome. That's great. You guys deserve a big round of applause. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> huh. Wow. That's interesting. This photo is courtesy of Stefan Gallery. Our son has a gallery, and he took this in a, on a balloon uh, excursion where he was the photographer on board. And uh, this is a volcanic cone right here on a normal fault. Everybody see that? That's a fault, and there's a volcanic cone right on it. So what I was just saying about the extensional faults tapping into a magma chamber actually occurs out here. So we have pretty good definitive uh, proof that it does. And this is... This is what a normal fault would look like, of course, and this is Spend Love Knoll in the lower Kola Plateau. And this, this particular cone is about 220 to 310,000 years old, so it's relatively young. All right. So again, you know, why, why didn't placement occur at that level? At least f for the Pine Valleys, why did, th did the magmatic material come up and then spread out along that zone? Something, something, it's something about that surface that made it so. So let's take a look. Let's make some observations. 
Well, let's start here. Let's make some observations here. Hmm. Anybody want to take a gander at an observation? The birds are all standing in a row, right? Anybody care to dabble in an interpretation? I heard it. Who said it? They're watching something. They are. I'm not sure what, but they are. <laughs> but what it is, it's just a, a buried power line. Oh. You know how they're used? That's, that's pretty sad. OK. OK. Let's start making some real observations here. <laughs> you thought I was being serious. Uh, OK. So, <laughs> so what do we know about that contact? Uh, a very uh, kind geologist, he moved from Ivan's. Um, Ben Everett? Who knows Ben Everett? Anybody? Yeah. Ben has taken many trips up to this contact right here. And the last time he went, I wanted to go with him and I wasn't able to, but he gave me a bunch of photographs that he took um, of that contact. So what you see here is the Claron Formation. Now, let me see if this is, yeah, okay. So the Monzonite, this material right here, if you looked at a an igneous rock classification triangle, it sits right here. That's called a monzonite. It's not very quartz rich, not like a granite. It doesn't have much quartz at all in it, as a matter of fact. But it's got a lot of basic material in it that makes it darker, but very coarse grained. Okay. So this is a very special contact. This is the pink Claron formation, pink portion of the Claron formation. It's the lower part of it. There's also a white, whiter portion of it. And then there might be a little sandy layer at the top. So kind of, kind of interesting. We're making observations. So what else do we know about the Claren? Number one, this is Bryce Canyon. Bryce Canyon is comprised of Claron. That's the majority of the rocks in Bryce Canyon are Claron. And this is, everybody recognize this? Thor's Hammer? Three Stooges? No? OK. OK. And we also know that. The Claron Formation was deposited in a very large uh, intermontane lake, and it's comprised primarily of limestone. It's a very important observation. It's made of limestone. Okay. And we sit right about here within Lake Claron. What else do we know about the Claron? Well, we all familiar with the Grand Staircase? You've all seen this illustration? This is the Kaibab uplift. The north rim of the Grand Canyon sits up on this limb of the anticline. This is a big fold that came apart, came uh, into being during the compressive phase. And all these layers back here have eroded back to the current profile, and it looks like a staircase. John Wesley Powell called it the Grand Staircase because it looks like a Grand Staircase. <laughs> and the pink cliffs um, are comprised of the Claron Formation. Okay, so the pink cliffs are, is the Claron, and that's the boundary at the Pine Valley Mountains where the Lackalith came into being as well. So in looking from uh, Lef the Lefebvre Overlook, looking back, you can see the chocolate cliffs, the vermilion cliffs, you can see the white cliffs, the gray cliffs, and the pink cliffs. That's the Claron sitting way off in the distance, okay, at the top of the Grand Staircase. It's the youngest rocks on the order of 50 to 55 million years old. So the rocks were around for 25, 30 million years prior to extension, prior to being pulled apart and fractured. OK, so here's one of uh, photos that Ben provided. Um, here's the Claron. Here's the contact. So what we know is the Claron's composed of limestone and that it was in place within the Claron. Okay, this looks like the pink Claron, the basal portion of the Claron. So somewhere in here is where that lacolith was emplaced. Somewhere up within, maybe midway up within the Claron. That's where that zone of weakness came in, or that zone of whatever it is where the lacolith was emplaced. Now, a close-up photograph of it, this is Claron. And this is the magmatic material that came in and filled in. And here's the contact. It's irregular. It look, looks like it came in and filled in um, cavities in the Claron. 
So we had this irregular surface in the Claron, and then this liquid came in, liquid rock came in, the magma came in and filled in those little depressions. Interesting. Also, you can see pieces of Claron incorporated into the igneous material. So at that surface, when it came in, there may have been um, some small boulders or cobbles or pebbles of Claron that got incorporated into the magma. That's interesting. So just to summarize, the Claron's composed of limestone. The contact is somewhere within uh, probably middle Claron. Um, the contact is irregular and material got incorporated into the magma when it was injected. Just observations, no interpretation yet. Okay, so why did it occur here? Why did it occur at that location within the Claron? So what else do we know about the Claron formation? Who's been to Bryce Point? Yeah, okay. Anybody see these? You can see some grottos. Let's look at a, another uh, example. We're, we're going to see caves in just a second. But. So when, you look at, when you're looking at a limestone, you usually have a topsoil layer, and then the limestone bed sits below it. When you have rain, cold water combined with CO2 creates carbonic acid. And that seeps down into the limestone and dissolves it, and you get caves and caverns that all hook up with one another. Who's been to South Florida, uh, Central Florida, to Disneyland, no, Disney World, Disney World, Disney World, yeah. The land of lakes, the reason it's the land of lakes is because of all the sinkholes that developed in the limestone, okay? So this is called karst topography. And it just refers to chemical weathering by water resulting in caves, sinkholes, cliffs, etc. So chemical weathering of limestone produces caves and cavern systems looking like this. So we have sinkholes, lots of sinkholes. Who's been to the north rim of the Grand Canyon? You see those circular ponds in the Kaibab limestone? Those are all sinkholes. And caverns. You can see caverns uh, below and with uh, springs coming out in, within the canyon. So limestone weathers through chemical weathering into caves and cavern systems. So when we look at the Claron, and this is not the pink, this is the, the pink contact is down here. This particular zone is not present up at Pine Valley. Okay, so what we see are grottos that are horizontally aligned. And what these represent is the position of a water table through time that stayed there for a while, that chemically weathered the limestone and created a system of caverns within the Claron, the, probably the upper to middle uh, Claron, similar to what you see here. Sometimes what we see are windows. Who's seen these? All this is, is a remnant of a fin that cuts through a cavern. So this is in 3D, these would be connected. If all this material was here, they'd be part of a cavern system, all these windows. So you're getting a nice 3D look at it. Sometimes you see a flat surface, and sometimes you see a surface perpendicular to the caves. So you kind of get the idea that if you were to continue them across, they continue over into the other part of the cavern. And again, we're just looking at these little little windows, little pieces, these little sections that are windows present day. So here we are, we had compression and we had magma chambers forming down below and then we had extension and we basically pulled apart the crust a little bit that allowed communication of magmatic material to come in to this cavern system which then filled up with liquid rock and through successive injection actually uplifted the material on top, the 500 to 600 feet that I mentioned, on top, and then it got eroded away. Okay, so that it looks like this. That's a possible explanation of why that material was injected at that point. So that zone of weakness could be a cavern system within the Claron formation. 
Now, I'm probably pretty much alone on this idea. Um, not too many people have <laughs> heard about it, or, uh, but uh, I kind of feel like a vegan cattle rancher's annual convention, being pretty, pretty, pretty alone. But uh, the more you, we think about it, the more I think about it, you know, the more um, we might uh, consider it as a working hypothesis. So when you look at the scientific method, you know, I would guess that somewhere maybe in there, and that's probably being generous, nowhere near completion. I think a lot, of, a lot more work needs to be done. Need to get up there and see if there's any evidence of contact metamorphism, where that material was injected. I've done some looking around the north side to see if I can see some of the Claron on the north side that's part of the upper section. It's there. Um, preliminary observations indicate, to me at least, that, yeah, it's probably, um, I'm biased, so I can't, I can't really, really say, but it looks like there could be a possible explanation for why the lacolith was emplaced at the stratigraphic level it was. It hit a zone of weakness in a cavern system and bowed the whole area up. So who came up with that idea? Kark? It turns out that I have a new, um, a new name that I have to use in the literature because when I went to one of my favorite um, shops to get a, a hot beverage, <coughs> I told the, uh, the person that um, my, name is, my name is Mark with a C, and uh, they came back and it probably was Kark, so, so that's Kark. So my new name is Kark. Okay, Kark or Mark, uh, are you going to get more specific about the Pine Valley Mountains or what? Or what? We all know that there's been like 7 million ounces of silver that's been mined. Um, from the area around Leeds, right? We're all familiar with that. Okay. I know, it, it, it gets a little cornier, so hang with me. So let's look at, at the impact on the local geology. So when that lacolith was emplaced, uh, it, you have extremely high temperatures. You're looking at between 1,300 and 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit, the material that's being injected into that country rock. So what happens when you do that, when you have this igneous body, this, this liquid rock down here, a lot of gas is expelled uh, up to the surface and into the porous rock surrounding that material. You get sulfur dioxide, uh, H2S, hydrogen sulfide, CO2. When that combines with groundwater, you get carbonic acid and sulfuric acid, and it gets extremely caustic down there, and it comes out in great pressure and injects into the rock. And in the case of leads, you get um, ore deposits, gold and silver. Now, ore deposits are classified based on their depth. Um, epithermal is very shallow, then mesothermal and deep. We're dealing with epithermal. And the rocks, that, the uh, elements that you get deposited are gold, silver, mercury, copper, lead, and zinc. Someone asked me if I drilled a well and a couple of wells and it came up with mercury, would it be called HG wells? <laughs> Probably not. Uh, so, <laughs> so what we're seeing here is, is our acid, acidic fluids being pumped into the rock and altering them with heat. And that's called epithermal alteration. The ore in Leeds is in the Springdale sandstone. And it's a hard sandstone in, in Zion, okay? You can hit it with your hammer and it's really, really hard. So that's part of the Kayenta formation. The Navajo sits here. You notice the Navajo goes from red and it kind of grays up into white. Anybody know what that's from? Yeah, it's chemical weathering. You know, cold water coming down through the Navajo, leaching out the, uh, the iron-rich minerals and bringing them down into the canyon as what they call tufa deposits along the fractures. So that's what it looks like at Zion. When you go over to Leeds on White Reef, the reason they call it White Reef is the, is the Springdale sandstone's white. It's been altered chemically and it has silver in it, close to the lacolith. So the heat and the acid, acid uh, deposited uh, ore-bearing minerals within Within the, uh, within the Springdale. And on the other side, on East Reef, you see the same thing. You see um, a, 
less, less alteration because it's a little bit farther away, but nevertheless you see it in altered Springdale sandstone due to the heat and acidic fluids. So that's the Springdale sandstone within the Cayenta that got altered. Is that the only rock that was subjected to epithermal alteration in, the, in this area? Well, no. Uh, the Navajo was as well. So if you look at a Landsat map, this is Snow Canyon. Here's the Pine Valley sitting right here. This is what we see going from north to south. We see white rock into red rock, right? You've all seen this? You can see beautiful examples of white, white uh, Navajo sandstone in the northern part of Snow Canyon. If you come over to this area right here, you can see the Pine Valley. You see white Navajo. And then you see red Navajo with lava flows holding up the white Navajo. So you see more epithermal alteration. And then, who's been to Yan Flat? Yeah. You can see all kinds of evidence of fluid flow through this rock that literally uh, transformed the rock from iron bearing to no iron within the rock. So when that material came in, we altered the rock from the heat and the acidic fluids, and acidic waters actually leached the Navajo sandstone of its iron-bearing cement, this, this material that was holding those sand grains together. So what happened was these, those fluids flowed out of, from, the, from the north to the south and created an epithermal alteration zone around the Lacolith. And we can go over to Gunlock right in here. In fact, we were over there the other day and I collected some specimens of the Navajo. It's very, very uh, delicate, delicate rock. So what happened to the iron? Well, if you go into Snow Canyon, who's seen Moki marbles? There's even iron that holds up these ridges. There's a concentration of iron uh, in the rock that holds up the ridges within the canyon. And if you look closely in here, there's a dark layer right in here that has quite a bit of dark um, layered iron uh, that actually makes the rock more resistant uh, to weathering. Oops. Let me, uh, sorry. Let me go back one. Got ahead of myself here. <laughs> okay. This is just a, an article from uh, Nielsen and Chan. Greg Nielsen did a, a, his master's thesis in Snow Canyon looking at the iron. And here you can see the white rock, and you can see the, the dark brown rock where a lot of that iron um, got transported away from uh, the north. Okay. Albert Einstein says, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. And I think that's a really good, good phrase to use. And I need another couple of volunteers here uh, just to kind of look at some, some rocks. Anybody, George? No? <laughs> this is some of the red sandstone uh, from Snow Canyon, and if you if you hit it with a hammer um, lightly, you can see that you can hear it. Do you hear that? Okay. And here's so this is actually uh, some white rock from Snow Canyon, and actually I'm I'm going to take the hammer from you because okay. you don't need it. So this is some of that white sandstone that was actually leached chemically um, by those acidic waters. Can you break that for me? Oh, yeah. Wow. It's like chalk. Can you can you can you like crumble it? Yep. It crumbles in your hand it does. because that cement is not holding that rock together anymore. So if you actually did hit it with a hammer, it's basically sand grains. So when you go up to White Rock Amphitheater. And you see all that white sand? It's because it's weathered um, ep uh, Navajo that's been altered thermally by epithermal alteration. Thank you, George. Thank you. Sorry to put you on the spot. I guess I'm famous for that. Okay. So we hear the term bleaching. Okay, this aren't, these aren't genes. We're not looking at taking your genes and bleaching them uh, with an oxidating uh, liquid. We're actually leaching the rock. And here's another example. This is sitting on top of Red Mountain. In fact, 
My brother-in-law, Lee, was with me on this trip, and we took this picture. And you can see that we're standing on the red rock, and you can see the white rock that's been epithermally altered by leaching. So, just like people, the Earth's behavior is rational if you understand the rules by which it exists. And plate tectonics is ultimate res ultimately responsible for the emplacement of the Pine Valley Lacolith and the resulting epithermal alteration of the surrounding country rock. So what did we go over tonight? We talked about Alfred Wegener and Hess, Harry Hess, and magnetic striping and DSDP, ODP, IODP um, that explains why, why the, um, the continents moved apart. Take a look at India here, moving up to the north, by the way. Creating what mountain chain is that? The Himalayas, yeah. Um, so we, we saw the evidence for plate tectonics. The theory is, it's not a theory anymore. It's pretty much a working uh, concept. We talked about the tectonic history of our area where we had an initial compressive phase that folded the rocks, parked a bunch of liquid rock below us, caused thrust faulting and uh, uplifts. And then we had a period of extension that communicated uh, those magma chambers to the surface via faults and fractures. We also saw that um, the Pine Valley Mountains came to be during that extension, extension period, and we can see uh, material coming up along these faults uh, that communicated with the magma chambers. And it also affected the local economy uh, with silver being mined up to the north in Leeds, and epithermal alteration in Snow Canyon. I know I led you um, through the swamp of, of uh, information. Um, my hope is, is that you're beginning to emerge uh, with a better understanding of what's happening uh, with the Pine Valley Mountains and also in Leeds and Snow Canyon. And with that, I am going to say fini. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, sir. Now your uh, the uplift and the whole the making of those uh, lacrylates kind of seems like a caving in reverse where the water drips down and you can bend some or line some or whatever. And then as the surface there can get to it, so it spreads sideways, and it's like the lava coming up. Yeah. Reverse the lava. I imagine, yeah. I imagine it could. Right. Yeah, you know, what could have happened, it may have been that there may have been a couple of small caves here and there, which were just zones of weakness. It filled up and then it spread out along that middle part of the Claron. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, or it could have been a, a porous sandstone or something there that, that gathered it. Yeah, the, only this was coming from the bottom. Yeah, yeah, it, it could be, it, it could be, and the only reason, the only reason I, I think that it might be um, a little bit, um, a little bit more of a cavernous situation is because the estimates for the, the timing of emplacement, such a very quick time geologically, that I, I, I kind of get, I kind of, it's a gut feel, I don't have anything quantitative to say, but I have a feeling that it had an easy time of it to get in there and bow the area up so quickly. But, but again, what would, need to, what would we need to do? You need to go look at the Abajos, you need to go look at the LaSalles, you want to go look at all the other lacoliths. Now I know that they, all of these lacoliths have um, ore deposits associated with them. Leeds does. Um, if you go over to the LaSalles, what's, what, are they, what do they mine over in LaSalle? LaSalle Mountains? Uranium, right? Henry's, same thing. Uh, silver, gold, uranium. Um, the Abajos, I think they have uranium there. So there's, there are, there's material being deposited associated with those lacolis that are re the result of melting of the crust and concentrating um, ore minerals around them. So they're, they're good places to, and I'm sure there are a lot of sites that are excavated that you could get in and actually look at the contacts. And was it a limestone? Was it a sandstone? Was it a fracture? What was it that it caused that emplacement along that horizon? Yes, sir. All the uh, volcanic activity in the area, that comes much later than uh, uh, shifting in the plate. 
Yeah, yeah. What, um, what we see <clears throat> is that extension is still happening. Okay, and what we see within, within these, these magma chambers, what can happen is that you can get uh, gravity segregation. In other words, the lighter materials will come up to the top of the chambers, just like, just like in soup, right? And the heavier material goes down to the bottom. So the first stuff out of that chamber is a lighter material, the stuff that the monzonite. And then later on, much later on, as a matter of fact, um, as much as 20 million years later, we start to see that very dark basalt coming out of those chambers because of continued extension in the area. So those faults get reactivated throughout that entire time. Things didn't stop at the 22 to 25 million years. It's still going on today, extension. So, so it's probably tapping into those magma chambers uh, much later. I think the youngest, uh, the youngest flow that I know of is on the Ewan Corret Plateau, and I believe it's close to like 10,000 years old. In Snow Canyon, it's a little over 27,000 years uh, old. So the volcanism spans a great deal of time, uh, ranging from the emplacement of the Lacolith all the way up to 27,500 or so thousand years old. It's been going on a long time, and episodes uh, associated with earthquake activity, et cetera. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, I, if not, um, you've been a great audience, a little shallow and insincere, but great nonetheless. <laughs> I appreciate you coming tonight to listen, and thank you. I had to use that. <laughs>